the next speaker, Professor Sanjay Sane, is somewhere in this ballpark. He's a sort of a biologist, I think. I think he will explain himself. But uh, he definitely works in a very interdisciplinary area. So Professor Sanjay Sane is, uh, is currently working at the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore. As he was an undergraduate student at St. Stephen's College, Delhi, and then he went on to do a master's from Pune University, and then he finally completed his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. He was at the University of Washington in Seattle for several years. He returned to join the NCBS in Bangalore a few years ago. He's been awarded a Ramanujan Fellowship by the Department of Science and Technology, India. He works on understanding the mechanics of flight, the flight of insects. That, well, Professor Sane. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to uh, the Institute of Mathematical Sciences for organizing this, uh, Gautam Raghun. This is a wonderful opportunity to be able to present this work, uh, which has been about, at this point, about 20 years in making. I think I'll, I'll be working on this um, for a long, long time. Uh, the question that I started asking about 20 years ago was uh, a simple one. I thought it was a very simple one. Uh, and it was, how do insects fly? And I think I'm still trying to answer that question. Why is this question so intriguing? What, what are the various, uh, uh, com complex, why is this a complex question? Let me try and illustrate this by showing you one movie, OK? And this is uh, a scene that you've seen uh, many, many, many times, uh, I'm sure. And, uh, but maybe not quite like this. I'm going to try and explain what this is. What you're going to see is a common house fly that comes from here, and it's going to land on this glass vial. Okay? I want you to take a pretty close look at it, because there's a lot of things going on. But before I start the movie, I want to give you a few facts. First is um, that this, the insect flaps its wings at about 200 to 250 hertz. That's about four or five milliseconds for each wing stroke. Okay? Now, we've filmed this with a very high-speed camera. Your standard camera uh, captures at about 25 frames a second, 25 to 30. This one was captured at about 2,000. We, we go much higher than that for uh, many different kinds of insects. And all of the action that you're going to see here is going to happen in a, in a matter of about 56 to 70 milliseconds. Okay? That's about half the time that it takes for your eye to blink. And the eye blink is maybe one of the fastest things that we do. OK, so what you're going to see is the, uh, the, the fly coming in. And watch. So here comes the fly. The fly knows that uh, she's going to land because her front legs are up. That's what flies do when they are close to landing. Now she's going to slowly pitch up, slow down, and she's going to gently land on this glass vial. This maneuver is extremely complex. Why is it complex? It's complex because what the fly is doing is getting information from multiple uh, sensors. Uh, she's seeing the glass vial as it, as it expands on her retina. Flies, as you know, have compound eyes. They're not very well resolved, uh, certainly not as well resolved as our eyes. But they can sense motion. And as this glass vial expands, there, is, there are reactions that the flies will uh, Im immediately uh, um, generate. And at the same time as it's seeing this while expand, it's also getting information from certain sensors that are at the back of the wings, which we'll see towards the end of the talk. They are called halteas. These are gyroscopic sensors that are able to convey information to the nervous system at extremely rapid rates. Now, there's a problem here, which is that vision is much slower than the Hortiers. Okay, the Hortiers provide input in matters of a fraction of a wing stroke. I'm going to play this movie again. Whereas vision uh, takes two to three wing strokes before it actually uh, computes. And the fly has to put together all of this information and then generate changes in its wing motion just, uh, just right to be able to pitch up, slow down, and, and uh, you know, gently land on this object. Now, to, to perform this task, the fly is equipped with a brain that looks sort of like this. So this is a human brain. 
That's a mouse brain, and that's, that's what the fly's brain is like. OK? It has a brain. And I can tell you that the brain is extremely complex. So if we zoom into that, that's sort of what it looks like. That's the head of the fly. This is the thorax. And that's, uh, that's the size of the brain inside the uh, head of the fly. And that's the part that serves uh, a lot of the thoracic ganglion and the ab ab abdomen of the fly. So it's this structure that is getting all this sensory input, processing it, generating responses, playing them through the muscles. And the muscles are all overlaid or top here, and, you know, all by the moving parts. Then the muscles contract, and what you get is a reaction. OK? The way my lab studies this question, this is, this is an example of a behavior. Okay? This is what we call behavior in animals. It's called behavior because it's something that you can uh, elicit repeatedly. You can do this again and again. The flies will do pretty much the same thing. I should mention this, though. Getting a film like this is extremely difficult. Okay? In fact, this one was got accidentally. What we were trying to do was film the fly as it got out of this glass vial. But, um, we accidentally hit the trigger late. The fly, meanwhile, did a nice sort of loop-de-loop -loop and gave us a, 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 just, just the final moments of approach. And the moment we saw this, we knew we had something very nice and that we had to recreate it in the lab someday and study it. So this is the example of behavior. Now, many this questions like these are not, um, not new, necessarily. People have forever asked questions uh, like how do flies fly, or how do birds fly, or how do um, dogs run, or cheetahs run. But they stretch back a long way. Uh, the, the modern way of thinking about this stretches back a long way. And this, we owe to uh, this great philosopher, René Descartes, uh, the first sort of formalization of this kind of thought. And he did that in a very famous book called A Discourse on the Method, uh, in which he began to articulate what the problem really was. Now, you have to realize that Descartes lived uh, at, a, at the same time as, uh, or roughly the same time as Newton, Galileo, Leonardo da Vinci, William Harvey. These were all extraordinary people. And what, what, is, what connects all of them is that they had begun to recognize the importance of mechanics. They had begun to connect the fact that physics was everywhere, that an apple falling was, uh, was somehow connected to the, to the moon going around the, the Earth. Um, and it was natural for them at the time to start asking, could, could we then extend this thinking to animals? Okay? And so Descartes took this a step further, and he asked, well, are all animals automatons? Are they all essentially robots? Uh, after all, they must follow the laws of physics. You push one thing, it pushes another, it pushes yet another, and what you have is a chain of reflexes, which then gives us what, what we see as a behavior. Could it be this? He excluded, I should mention, he excluded humans from all of this because uh, he uh, argued that they have souls and animals don't, and so you know, humans were excluded. But of course, we know better now. So let's take this thinking uh, and see how it works out. So suppose this were an animal, OK? This is an object we all recognize. We know that there are some external parts, and we want to know something about them. So let's say there's a behavior that we want to study. For instance, how does this car go from 0 to 60 kilometers an hour in 10 seconds, OK? And we know that every time we press the accelerator, the car speeds up, and we get, we get a behavior. One way of trying to answer this question is by opening up the car and laying out all its parts. And that's what you'll see. It's, it's a very complicated uh, uh, piece of machine. And if, even if you understood how all of these parts uh, make, you know, fit together, we may not really understand how the car works. Because for us to understand how the car works, we need an additional piece of information, which is this the wiring diagram of a car. How do things connect to each other? And this is akin to the animal's nervous system. Now, if you think that this question is complex, then imagine an animal. Everything I just showed you, even a single cell is more complicated than this. 
And I'm not talking of a single cell, but of an entire animal. So you have to put together many cells, different kinds, all sorts of things going on there. This is a very complex problem, which is what makes it so interesting. So how do you think through these problems? What do you do? Suppose you see behavior. How do you go, go forth and start asking uh, questions that are science, uh, that bring out the science in the question? So I've just put down some of the steps here, which is you first observe the behavior in natural conditions. You don't want to study something that only occurs in, in your room. Uh, you want it to be some, something that's naturally uh, relevant. But the next thing you want to do is bring it to the lab and be able to actually recreate it. So you, we do all sorts of things to uh, elicit uh, behavior from animals. We, we give it artificial video screens, we give it virtual reality, we get it to control its own environment, play video games, all sorts of things, okay? And just doing that is a lot of fun. But what it does is eff effectively allow you to peer into the brain of the animal, okay? And once you do that, you measure the behavior under very controlled conditions, okay? And then, then you know if you perturb something, something else changed, and you, you can connect these things. Then you start uh, formulating the word falsifiable is very important here. Falsifiable hypothesis. What you do is you come up with tentative explanations based on what you know and ask, is that explanation, can I disprove this explanation? Okay, and if you can disprove it, then great. Then you, you, you keep trying to come up with hypotheses and keep trying to disprove them. If you cannot disprove it, then you have maybe something that looks like uh, the truth. We ask questions like, what is it for? How does it work? How did it develop over the insect's lifetime? How did it evolve over the insect's evolutionary history? These are all extremely uh, relevant questions for any given behavior. And then we test this hypothesis. And once we have some idea of what the answer might be, we then start building models. This could be mechanical models. This could be um, mathematical models to formalize what we are seeing. And a lot of what we are beginning to do now with behavior is use uh, control theory, which is an engineering tool to be able to address these questions. And then once you think you have the answer, then you go out on the, on, the, on the road, you seek critical feedback, you give talks, and you get criticized or praised, which is rare. Um, and then you send out, uh, you know, you give out seminars, you send out papers, and then you ask for uh, criticism. And if it holds up all of that, then uh, you have a publication and then you move to the next question. This is very important because this is what keeps us employed. So that that's, was general. Now this is specific to insects. So my lab is behavior centric. What we do is we look at behavior and then we start uh, looking at uh, behaviors in the natural context. We ask what is going on out there? Um, and these could be occurring in, in these sorts of contexts. So you have mate finding, food finding, territoriality. Uh, you may have noticed the same houseflies that I just talked about chasing other houseflies. And actually, they're very brutal chases. They can push each other and do all sorts of things. So observe closely next time you see houseflies, a bunch of houseflies around. And then navigation. Navigation is something that we in the subcontinent are extremely lucky to see because we see these uh, examples of long distance navigation, also short distance navigation, but long, long distance migrations. There are dragonflies, that, as you might have heard, that go from India to Africa. Okay? Single dragonflies. It's pretty amazing that they're able to do this. Well, once you found the behavior, then you take it to the lab, and then you start asking these sets of questions. What is the sensory feedback that the fly is using or the insect is using? How does that, uh, that feeds into the CNS, the central nervous system, which then generates a motor pattern? A motor pattern is a set of activity in neurons that, uh, that are connected to the muscles. And these neurons cause the muscles to contract. When the muscles contract, they pull on various body parts, and that's what's happening all of here. And those body parts then move, the thorax vibrates, when the thorax vibrates, somehow that vibration translates into wing motion. And that's what this is, motion of the wings, kinematics. 
And the moving wings then connect to the external fluid medium. They, they exert a force on the external fluid. Uh, the the uh, force is exerted upon them, which is then uh, uh, causes the insect to turn or toss around. And that's, that's what we see as a maneuver. So here's some examples of natural behavior. Okay? Here's an insect that we study. And this is a, a oleander hawk moth called Daphnis neri. And it's feeding on a bunch of lantana flowers. You see this insect even in Chennai. So it, it's a wonderful insect. But this one was shot in infrared because it operates in dark. It operates under pretty low light conditions. And, and yet, as you can see, it has a proboscis. And it is able to feed from these tiny flowers pretty nicely. Okay? And this, obviously, is, is extremely interesting. Plus, it is very stable when it's flying, uh, which is not our experience. If you had to close your eyes and walk, uh, it would be difficult. Well, even they would not be able to fly if they had to close their eyes. But under very low light levels, they can still do this job pretty well. All of this action happened you know, in, in a few uh, centimeters range. Here's another one. This is uh, a moth that uh, I study in Panama. Uh, it's called Urania fulgens. And it's uh, migrating over long distances. It goes from uh, the north of uh, Colum Colombia to the south of uh, uh, to the south of Mexico, okay. So it's it's migrating the entire uh, across the Central America uh, strip, and here's uh, my collab. So we, we chase these in boats, motor boats, and um, here's my collaborator capturing this. He's actually balancing on the prow of a boat that water has for crocodiles, um, and he's going to capture it, and then we do experiments with it. So it can get pretty exciting. So once we found the behavior, we bring it back to the lab. Now, I just showed you this, uh, this insect landing. And it took us about a year, year and a half to actually get the, uh, the assay to work. When we saw it, we knew we wanted to work on it. And we managed to get it finally to work in our hands, to, to get the fly to repeatedly sit in a place where we wanted it to sit. And it was this box here. And once we could do that, we could actually focus two high-speed cameras very close. Now, if any of you have done photography, you know that it's very difficult uh, to get good depth of field if you're using macro lenses, right? And so, but we are able to use two cameras to get this uh, behavior. And you can see, uh, we can track the wings. Once we can do that, we have a, a three-dimensional uh, way of looking at the wings. And those graphs are just the movement of the wings. And each one is actually two lines, but you don't see them as two because they are uh, extremely symmetric. And we'll come to that question in a little bit. And just as it is going to land, you see a huge drop in its uh, wing beat amplitude. So once you have these kind of, what, what you have here is, is the three-dimensional di three kinematics of the wing motion. Now, what you can do next is ask the question, how do you, uh, what, what does it mean to have this, this kind of wing motion in terms of forces? So in the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about the aerodynamics. Now, what we did many years ago, this is work that I did as a PhD student, was uh, develop a device that was able to uh, measure forces. Now, this is a device that is much larger than the fly. It's about, uh, this wing is about 25 centimeters. And the base of the wings uh, are, are, uh, is a force sensor that measures the forces on the wings, OK? One set of forces on, along this, and one set of forces along that. Now, what we can do is this wing is actuated by three stepper motors, which allow us to move it in any, uh, uh, along any 3D pattern. And so we can just feed in the pin pattern that we measured into this. And, and get the desired motion. Now, I told you that this is a 25 centimeter long wing. How can it, act, uh, how can it recreate something uh, that, that is a 2.5 millimeter wing, uh, how the physics around a 2.5 millimeter wing? Well, the trick we use is something called dynamic scaling, where what we do is we conserve two numbers. One is the Reynolds number, and the other is reduced frequency. The Reynolds number is just the ratio of inertial to the viscous forces. So if you take a little bolus of fluid and you push it in air, it takes some time before it, uh, it actually slows down and halts. And if you conserve that 
uh, time or the, that the ratio of the inertia to the viscous uh, 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 forces on this bolus, then you get, uh, then you have basically the same fluid mechanics around the wing. And so what we do is we, we put the kinematics that we measure through this, this whole thing to achieve dynamic scaling is inserted in a large tank of mineral oil, uh, and then we measure the forces, okay? And this is uh, just a, a video to show you what it looked like. This was pretty much the first uh, time we moved it. And you can see the force sensor there. And what we also do is fill the mineral oil with air bubbles, which then uh, we, uh, we, we can use to visualize the flow. And you can see vortices generating here, and we can actually uh, start to visualize these vortices, not just qualitatively, but also quantitatively. So what we do is we throw a laser sheet across, a whole a sheet of laser, which looks like a, a TV screen. And in this laser uh, sheet, you see a distribution of bubbles. And what you then do is keep tracking the distribu how the distribution of bubbles changes from frame to frame. Okay, and then you get plots like this. So each, um, each dot here is actually an arrow. And that arrow gives you uh, the, the vector direction in, of, of the motion of the fluid. And this is uh, a velocity field. And you can begin to see structures uh, which were mentioned earlier, vorticity, right? So this is a vortex, and this is sort of the vorticity plot of that. And there you can see the vortex more clearly. And one thing that uh, we noticed was that there was a leading edge vortex right at the, um, at the tip of that uh, uh, leading edge. Now, here's a more modern version of it. I uh, called it reloaded in the style of matrix reloaded. But this one has a body, and we're using it to do other, different kinds of experiments. You can see those uh, bubbles and the uh, vortices uh, in the laser sheet in this, in this particular case. This is now housed in Purdue University. Now, at the heart, this is a very uh, straightforward system. What you have is an inclined wing. Fluid comes in, is pushed down, and you get forces. And people used to um, analyze these kinds of questions because they didn't have wing beat kinematics uh, uh, using models that were essentially like helicopters, okay? What, what was new about the way that we were doing it, and, uh, and Charlie Ellington, whose photographs you'll see in a little bit, were doing was that uh, we were actually using uh, a flapping um, wing, okay? And there's a huge difference between a flapping wing and a fixed wing. So all previous analyses used sort of fixed wings to analyze this case. So you had a wing in a wind tunnel, and you measured forces, and you tried and guessed what the uh, forces would be based on these kinds of calculations. But things are dramatically different in a fixed versus flapping wing. So here you see what those differences are. In a fixed wing, as an inclined wing moves, there's a vortex that develops and it grows in size, but eventually this system becomes unstable. And that arrow shows you the fluctuation of the forces. As these vortices are shed, you start seeing these large changes in forces. This is called the stall. And what we noticed was that there was absolutely no stall in, in the case of an inclined wing when it was flapping. So a vortex developed just like in the initial stages here, but then it stayed the same size and pretty much stable. And so what was happening was flow was going around and meeting the flow from below, and then you had a, a stable uh, forces on this. How were these, uh, how were these vortices set staying small and stable? Why didn't they grow? The answer to that came from Charlie Ellington's work. Charlie was working in Cambridge. Um, he's now retired, but uh, he's pretty much the Moses of this field, if you will. And what he showed was there was an actual flow that went from the base of the wing to the tip, and that kept pushing out momentum and keeping the vortex small and stable. And that's how the, uh, the wing was able to uh, generate forces uh, so at such a constant rate. So we are able to put the entire kinematic pattern through this and able to measure all the forces. And we were able to model this also because we were able to use a method called quasi-steady modeling, the idea that you can, at each time instant, have a certain force configuration that you can uh, calculate empirically and then sort of go back and 
uh, plug it in. And this allowed us to um, outline these uh, mechanisms of force generation. The first, as I al already mentioned, was the absence of the delayed stall, that we didn't get this stall. But the second was something that happened right towards the end of the wing. As the wing turned, there was an extra force bump that we got there. And then as the wing reversed stroke, it bumped into the fluid that it had just pulled with it. And that gave another additional boost. And those are things that you can see in these peaks here. So we were able to outline all these different force mechanisms. And this work now continues, where we are now not looking at rigid wings, but flexible wings. And uh, we've been able to do also a three-dimensional PIV, uh, particle image velocimetry of this whole uh, flow. OK. So the next set of questions relate to uh, the mechanics uh, of how the sensory input and the, uh, the, the thoracic vibrations translate into uh, wing motion. Now, as you might all be aware, insects are the most uh, successful animals, multicellular animals on Earth. If there are something like uh, six to 10 million species estimated, only more than one million have been described. There are more than 90% of all multicellular animals. Uh, a large number of them are beetles. Um, but the most impressive thing is that they range in size scales by three orders of magnitude. And this is seen somewhat dramatically here. On your left is a fossil of a dragonfly. Okay? This was uh, existing in the Carboniferous period. And it had uh, a wingspan. So from here to here, about 65 centimeters. That's more than two feet. Very large. Okay. Of the extant taxa, this is the largest uh, insect that we know of. This is called the Queen Alexandra's bird wing. That's a male. That's a female. And that has a wingspan of about 30 centimeters, about half of that. At the other end of the scale is this tiny little insect that we've just begun to work with now. Uh, not exactly this one, but something like this. Now, that's the scale bar. That's 200 microns. That's the size of a single cell, a paramecium. And here you see an insect that's fully formed. It's got antennae. It's got eyes. It's got wings that look like feathers. But at these small scales, feathers are like plates. This animal is able to do pretty much everything that a normal insect can do. It can mate. It can find food, all sorts of things. How it is able to do this is, is a really challenging question, and we think it's worth uh, looking into. So a student of mine started to ask, what are the consequences of miniaturization? How, how is the nervous system able to deal with the speeds uh, at, at which things are miniaturized? And the question we specifically honed in on had to do with uh, uh, a particular behavior that you see in this insect. This is also a fly. And what you will see if you focus right about there is that the hind wing uh, has, is a haltia that I just mentioned at the beginning of the talk. But that structure is exactly out of phase with the wing. So if the wing goes up, the haltia goes down, and they keep doing this. At 100 times a second, how is this animal able to finally coordinate these two movements? That's the question that she uh, wanted to ask. This is Tanvi Devra's work. Watch this. Can you see that it's exactly opposite? Now, those structures, as I mentioned, are gyro gyroscopic sensors. They are able to sense as the insect is turning in midair. And they are able to uh, very quickly uh, up up update the status of flight for the insect. If you look at the base of that haltia, you see tons of sensors, literally tons of them. So if you just focus on this part, you'll see many little bumpy structures there. Each bump is a neuron. Okay, it's, a, it's, a, it's something called a companiform sensor. The base of it is a neuron that throws the projection into the nervous system. And a bunch of them are, are uh, computing the strain on that uh, structure. And that strain somehow tells the animal whether it's turning, at what rate it's turning, and so on. Now, these structures are essential for flight control. So I'll just show you a four videos which should convince you of that. So this is a normal insect as it, takes, uh, as it takes off. And you can see that it's pretty stable. 
uh, it's able to fly quite nicely. It has its hot ears intact, okay? Now what we do is we go in and clip off those hot ears, and that's this insect right here. Now watch this insect. As you can see, it completely fails in, uh, in flight. It's doing tumbles. I'm sure many of you are thinking, what happens if you cut just one hot ear? Not both, but just one. So we've done that too. And what you see is that if you just cut the left hot ear, then the insect begins to take uh, turns in one direction, and if just the right hot ear, then in the other direction. Okay. Now, what these hot ears are doing, this is shown here, is they, they sense the strains on the, uh, on the base of the hot ear, and then they can communicate that information to the wing motor neurons, the, motor, the neurons that talk to the muscles of the wings. And so there's a, a rapid correction of the wing motion as the hot ears are um, moving. Now, how are these two coordinated? We, had, we thought initially going in, that uh, this must be done through sensory uh, feedback. So wing sensors are talking to the hot ear motors. Wing goes up, hot ear goes down. Or hot ear sensors are talking to the wing motors. Hot ear goes up, wing goes down. Or a single neuron that talks to both um, tells this one to go up or this one to go down. Okay. However, this is not the exhaustive set of hypotheses. Okay. There's a fourth hypothesis, which is easier to test, and which is that they're just mechanically coupled. Okay, so they're just connected through the thorax, and we decided to test that one first because it's, it's easy to do in dead insects, right? In dead insects, the nervous system is not working. And so here's a dead insect, and what uh, Tanvi is going to do is just move one of the wings and watch what happens to the hortia. Do you see that the hortia moves exactly opposite to the wing? Now, what this tells you is that all of this is mechanically coupled. What you saw was that movement of one wing caused the other wing to move and both hot ears to move. So all of this must be mechanically coupled. And so then what she did was embark on a series of experiments, which we called the dead bug experiments, okay, in which she made little cuts on the thorax and asked, what does it do to this coordination? And so this is a normal insect, wings go up, hot ears go down. Now you make a cut over the top of the thorax, wings go up, this hot ear goes down, but nothing happens here. So the, so the connection must be, uh, the connection between the wings must be going from the top. You can make any kinds of cuts on this part of the thorax, nothing happens. This is this part right here. But if you make a, a cut in this part of the thorax, it's called the scutellum, then again you get that the same effect as that. And so what that meant was that the two wings were connected through that part of the thorax. Okay? So then we asked, is this true in a live insect? So this is a normal insect. This is an insect with that, that part cut, and you can see that the coordination completely goes away. This insect cannot fly. It wouldn't be able to fly. It will just tumble around. Okay? This is a tethered insect, obviously. So there must be something else that connects the wings to the hot ears, right? This, this establishes how the two wings are connected, but how are the wings and the hot ears connected? That took her a long time uh, because it was a very difficult part of the thorax. So there was a connection that went between the base of the wings to the base of the hot ears, which we gave a very biology-sounding name. It doesn't matter what it is. And if you lesion it, then now you see that the, wing, the hot ears are not on this side opposite to the wings anymore. They're moving with the wings, almost in phase. Whereas the hot ears on the other side are uh, exactly anti-phase. So all of this got us to a model. Okay, that's the model. Uh, and this model essentially tells you that the wings and hot ears are coupled oscillators. Okay, that uh, they're connected by the scutellum. Uh, if you cut the scutellum, then the coordination goes away. The wings and hot ears are connected by this wing hot ear linkage. If you cut that, then that uh, screws up the, the uh, wing and hot ear coordination. 
But we found something else. And I'm going to show you a short video that uh, describes the later part of this. Doing at a time. To address this question, we propose the hypothesis that there are tears are constrained to move in synchrony by mechanical linkages. How do insects achieve control of just one wing at a time? To address this question, we propose can the we hypothesis that there exists a clutch at the base of each wing, which can engage and disengage the wing from the mechanical linkages. When the clutch is engaged on both sides, the two wings flap together. However, when the clutch is disengaged on one side, one wing remains folded, whereas the other can flap. Apart from the clutch, the base of the wing contains a gearbox. Once the wing is engaged, the gearbox controls the amplitude of each wing. If we zoom into the base of the fly wing during active flapping, we can see the wing edge. It consists of a radial stop shown in red, a plural wing process shown in yellow, and Terale C, a putative mechanosensor and damper shown in blue. The radial stop contacts plural wing process in four different modes. Mode 0, 1, 2 and 3 as shown here. In this scanning electron microscope image, we see how the radial stop connects with the plural wing process in four different ways from mode 0 to mode 3. Here is a video of the wing engagement at the start of flight as the radial stop moves from mode 0 to higher modes. Notice the shift in the wing amplitude from very low to very high within a single wing stroke. Once engaged, the wing hinge shifts between the different modes and the wing moves at high amplitudes. This is akin to the gear change operation in automobiles. Did you see the change in uh, wing motion? During flight cessation, the wing abruptly transitions from high amplitude to low amplitude within a wing stroke as seen in this video. So in here it when goes from happens, high gear to the low gear. The radial stop moves from higher modes to more zero. Okay, so... If the wings and hot ears are constrained... So... So what we are now beginning to get really interested in is where the clutch is. We don't know where the clutch is. We know it's there, but we don't know where it is. Now the canonical diagram of the wing hinge looks something like this, and it's extremely complicated. This is one of the most complex, um, what happened? Sorry. It's one of the most complex joints uh, that we know. And you can see all of these are different parts of the, uh, the thorax, uh, the cuticle on the thorax. And they all connect, not all of them, most of them connect to muscles. Okay? And I'm just going to show you a short video uh, which shows you those muscles. Okay, this is a micro CT image. This is uh, a project that we are now pursuing with uh, Namrita Gundiya's lab at IISC. 
Uh, here's the scutellum that connects the two wings. That's the subepimeral ridge, which connects the wings and the halteas. There's the radial stop. That's the gearbox. That's the teralis C. Here's the flight muscles. Those are all those different structures that you just saw the diagram of. And they're, they're connected. Uh, they're sort of stacked one on top of each other, sort of like this. And then you can see those muscles that are controlling them. That's the tendon. That's more muscles. Again, tendons that are controlling this part of the hinge. More tendons, more muscles. There's something like 18 to 19 pairs of these muscles, okay? And they are all focused on just trying to make sure that the, the wing hinge is properly uh, configured. Uh, to be able to do all these fine uh, changes in the motion of the wing. There you go, there's these tendons connecting, and it's almost like flying kites. Okay, so, so that's where we are. Uh, I've, I've just sort of taken you through this wild kind of journey. There's many more questions right there which I didn't get time to talk about. But uh, there's a lot of people involved in all these efforts, a lot of funding agencies, uh, a lot of students. And they are the ones who really keep this going. The ones in black are all co uh, collaborators from various parts of the world. Um, and we've been of chugging along, and that's the crew that keeps me going. Thank you. So let me first ask some of the questions that have come by Twitter. If you have time, we will come back to them. Yes, OK. So let me first begin with a, a, a suggestion from one of our audi audience members today. They suggest that uh, instead of calling it RoboFly Reloaded, you should have called it Neo RoboFly to make it more of a matrix. Thank you. I, I, I'll in incorporate that one. Okay. So let's first start with an with a somewhat irreverent question. Uh, Mr. Arun Kumar asks you, uh, why should we be interested in insect flight when there are so many other pressing problems? Where does this fall within the larger perspective of things? Well, uh, there are many different directions in which this goes. I already talked about uh, the aspects of the nervous system and what it takes to speed up nervous system. The basic questions here that allow us to know what the nervous system does and how it does it. Okay? And this is, uh, I should mention, in an insect whose world we live in. It's not the other way around. I insects have been around longer than us. They'll be around longer than us. So it is, uh, I think, important to study them. But let me come to a more uh, immediate application of this, which is that in the recent floods uh, that occurred in Chennai, one of the technologies that was employed in trying to find people who were uh, stranded was drones. And this effort was funded by uh, uh, a DRDO group called Sigma, which asked people to do something, uh, build uh, flapping devices uh, which were inspired by insects, and um, that, that effort led, led to this. So I think there are applications that we cannot even think about. Um, there's many, many more things, but time is short. <laughs> Good. Okay. So let's move to another question from Mr. Selva Tirmal. Uh, he asks, is it possible to have a machine that can flap its wings fast enough so it can actually lift itself off the ground and fly? That's a good question. And uh, such efforts are just beginning to bear fruit. Uh, there's a group in Harvard that is uh, doing this. Uh, uh, they have just been able to uh, get the insects to get off the ground and just barely hover. Um, we're still a long way from having a good controllable insect. But I think the question has moved from it being able to hover or be off the ground to something that is uh, much more controllable. Thank you. 
that, let's move to the next, perhaps more aspirational question. Could we ever think of humans flying like insects at some point? Uh, not by flapping their wings. They can fly first class, <laughs> but they can't flap their wings. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanjay. With that, we will end the session. But uh, please let me say, we have one more, one more talk after this. After that talk, we will have about 15 minutes of time. In that time, we will have a more informal discussion. Let's move on to the, the next speaker today.